<laughs> Welcome friends. Good afternoon. Good evening. Happy spring. Despite the fact there <laughs> two inches plus of snow fell today. <laughs> Did anyone else have snow? <laughs> Let us know in the chat where please go ahead and introduce yourselves as well. Share your name, share where you're hailing from, whether it is what we now call these places or the indigenous names that are still so real of these cultures that are still so present with us today. I am Petra here at Fruition Seeds, hailing from Haudenosaunee Seneca occupied lands and here in the Finger Lakes of upstate New York. Can't wait to see you here on the farm one day. Sending love to Long Island, Indiana, the Catskills. Yes, I love, love, love that we are all here together. And I'd love to take a moment to just thank some folks. First and foremost, you who are showing up live this evening and also you who may be tuning in after the fact. And thank you so much to Kira Avery, currently interpreting. And thank you so much to Miriam Lerner who will soon, soon see sharing their joy and language justice with us tonight. Also huge thanks to my partner, Matthew, who is in fact in the chat. So anytime you have a question, <laughs> dive right in and he will be right there with you, whether it's a clarifying question or a great big overarching existential question. That's why we are all here. So go ahead and drop it in the chat and I can't wait for Matthew to accompany you. Thank you, Matthew. I'd also love to thank our Fruition crew. There are 10 of us full time at Fruition Seeds these days and I could not do it without every single one of them. I would not be here standing smiling <laughs> were it not for all of us. So thank you so much to the Fruition crew and to all of our ancestors, plants and humans, who have for millennia and for millions of years in the case of our plants been adapting to life on earth and making it more delicious and more beautiful. So this evening, I'm so delighted to share a lot of info. We're gonna go from basil to zinnias. We're talking about how to dial in the techniques and the timing so that you can surround yourselves with abundant annuals this year. We're going to specifically be lifting up basil as well as zinnias and heavens above. There's so much more to share, so many more details. So there will be a lot of overarching notions, but I'm so delighted to share them all with you and all of the questions that you find in the meantime. So yes, let's dive right into this wonderful poem. I love to begin and end all of our sessions with a poem, song, story, something for our time together. And today, a poem by Naomi Shihab Nye. So much happiness. It is difficult to know what to do with so much happiness. I should say this poem, I was inspired to choose this poem tonight for the love of Zinnias. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, it is difficult to know what to do with so much happiness. With sadness, there's something to rub against, a wound to tend. With lotion, with cloth. When the world falls in around you, you have the pieces to pick up, something to hold in your hands, like ticket stubs or change. But happiness, happiness floats. It doesn't need you to hold it down. It doesn't need anything. Happiness lands on the roof of the next house singing and disappears when it wants to. It lands if you are happy either way. And even the fact that you once lived in a peaceful tree house and now you live over a quarry of noise and dust cannot make you unhappy. Everything has a life of its own. If it too could wake up with a life of limitless possibilities of coffee cake, of ripe peaches, and even 
Oh, my screen is not going down. Pardon this moment of facilitator transparency. <laughs> oh, wow. Thank you, Kira. <laughs> wow. Well, my computer screen is not moving down, so I cannot, in fact, finish this poem. <laughs> <laughs> which is just delightfully <laughs> when you're happy <laughs> even unhappy things can just foster the sense of happiness in your life <laughs> because it's just delightful the irony <laughs> of happiness and also the transience of all emotion happiness included <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I will follow up in the email with this marvelous poem. That was awesome. And yes, I made the happiness of zinnias of all the things that we grow this year surround us and so many more people with those moments of happiness that we can't tack down. So yes, now let's dive into what is the next hour of our lives going to look like? We're going to talk about the history specifically of the zinnia tonight. And then we will dive into garden planning around zinnias, basil, and other annuals. Then we'll talk about sowing them. Then we'll talk about transplanting and growing them. We'll talk about weeding, feeding. We'll talk about pests with zinnias and basil. We'll talk about diseases with zinnias and basil. We'll talk about growing zinnias, basil, and continue containers. We'll talk about companion planting. We'll talk about succession sowing. We will have some harvest tips. And then, well, we'll just see if we have any more time left and we'll see what happens next. So without further ado, a little bit of the history of the zinnia. Native to Central America, the center of diversity of is of the zinnia is what we now call Mexico. And the Aztecs had a wonderful word for zinnia, which I definitely can't pronounce, but roughly translates to <laughs> not hard on the eyes. <laughs> conquistadors apparently felt differently when the conquistadors arrived in the 1500s and were promptly taking, stealing seeds and bringing them across the continent, even as they were bringing enslaved people across <laughs> the oceans, they were bringing back seeds of all kinds of things, zinnias included. And the Spanish called them mal de ojo, which I don't claim to speak Spanish, but that definitely translates roughly to hard on the eyes. So the conquistadors did not find this flower nearly as beautiful as the Aztecs did. So fast forward, 1750, the German ambassador in, to Mexico sent some seeds in a little envelope to Johann Gottfried Zinn. <laughs> and he was a German botanist and he was describing all kinds of plants for his good friend Linnaeus. And so Gottfried um, Zinn had all kinds of ways of describing this plant, this flower. Um, and he definitely concurred with the hard on the eyes sentiment, even in that initial documentation um, of the binomial nomenclature, which Linnaeus promptly um, decided to name Zinnia after this, you know, Han Gottfried Zinn. So hence why we call zinnias zinnias. And fast forward to the late 1800s. That was just this epic romantic renaissance in for a French horticulturalist going nuts. And also the Victorians, just whether it was flowers, vegetables, herbs, so much energy going into making all of these plants so much more diverse and very beautiful to our modern standards, anyhow. And so from that's where zinnia and what we would now think of as zinnias really started to come into being. And so a lot of the foundation of what we now know as zinnias was then, whether it was petal shape, general size and including colors. There was so much diversity that was teased out um, in that time. And yeah, it was uh, the zinnia was reintroduced to Turtle Island in North America in the late 1700s. It didn't go anywhere, but in that those French varieties suddenly became quite popular. And in the 1940s, 
a seed company called Burpee, <laughs> which hadn't existed too long, started to do a lot of their own development of zinnias. Variety development is a whole other subject, which I look forward to sharing more at length with us all one day. And in the meantime, know that they were doing it in a lot of different ways. There's kind of more classical plant breeding, just looking at what exists and then chasing those wormholes from there. And they also started experimenting with some of the precursors of genetic modification, as in like big capital G M. They were literally taking harsh chemicals, laying seeds in them, hoping that it would transform chromosomes so that novel traits could be expressed. And indeed they were. So what we think of as a lot of the more modern, truly modern varieties, totally uh, it came to be in that time with <laughs> burpees experimental explorations so whether it's the pom-pom style cactus style the benneries entire benneries line benneries giant all of those that bennery series originates from that time um, button cactus all of those different styles of petals of gloss of colors so many of those are in fact the legacies of burpees chemical which <laughs> explorations which killed most of the seeds and created all kinds of very unimpressive and very malformed and um, clearly <laughs> not excellent things but those varieties some of them stuck. So yes, wild times. And of course now zinnias are one of the most popular plants on the planet. Certainly they're one of my favorites. And we'll talk so much more about how to grow them now. So now let's talk about garden planning. When it comes to planning, there, here are some things to keep in mind for both basil and zinnias. You can direct sow or transplant them. And with most seed packets, you'll find growing info. Certainly with our seed packets, you'll find on the back, direct sow or transplant only. Um, it might also say direct or transplant if in fact both of those things are true. You'll see in the basal packets that it says direct sow or transplant. With zinnias, we tend to transplant them. They say transplant only, but if you really don't want to transplant them, we'll talk about sowing indoors soon. If that doesn't sound like your cup of tea, know that it is possible. It just is a lot more work, but in certain ways. So we'll talk about those pros and cons soon. So know that you can do both and just with any annual, pay attention to what, to whether they would be best direct sown or transplanted. You can also take a look in our um, Rise and Shine Starting Seeds with Ease book, which is our 40 page seed starting book. And it has tons of awesome info. You can find beautiful paper copies on our website. You can also get the free 40 page, just kind of black and white version. That's a free PDF download that you can easily print at home. And that has direct so as well as transplanting charts in it, along with so much else. 15 steps to st spectacular seedlings and so much more. So definitely download that if you haven't already. And um, yeah, if you don't have grow lights, it's really important in this planning session to be just considering direct sowing them or only starting them indoors three weeks. Ideally, they're four week old seedlings, um, but if you don't have any light, they're most likely going to be stressed. And we'll talk about that soon in the growing portion too. But just know if you don't have a light, you're probably better off direct sowing a lot of these annuals, unless you really, if it really says transplant only. So another key to keep in mind in planning, if you don't like weeding, definitely dial in transplanting in your life. It's totally worth it. Also dialing in mulch in your life, totally worth it if you don't love to weed. Other facets of succession sowing, something like basil is going to be succession sown. We succession sow basil every month at fruition so that you're, we're constantly harvesting the freshest, young, most tender, most sweet, delectable basil leaves. 
If you do plant just one, you possibly could just keep it pinched back. We'll talk more about that soon. And you'll, you can have that single plant for the whole season. But I highly recommend at least two successions, if not three. So especially if you really are interested in the highest quality flavor, succession sowing is key. With zinnias, you can have one succession. Honestly, we just to have one succession of zinnias the whole season. If you are a sincerely devout florist and just want the biggest, most opulent blossoms the entirety of the season, succession sowing zinnias every month is the way to, because although they blossom all season long and just pick up steam the entire season, their diameter of blossoms are going to be smaller with every month that passes. So few thoughts on planning out your basil and zinnias. Another couple thoughts, companion planting, which we'll talk more about soon. They're amazing companion plants, basil and zinnias. So plan on planting them everywhere, especially if you love to eat them with your eyes as well as with your mouth in the basil department. And containers, awesome. We'll talk more about container gardening soon. 10 gallons minimum so that you are making your life easy, which is making your <laughs> plants life easy. And finally, the more light and the more nutrients means more foliage and more flowers. So now let's dive right into talking about sowing them. So here from the outset, basil, zinnias, and many annuals beyond like tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, those are more like five, six week plus old transplants. Ideally started six, eight week before the final frost. Basil, zinnias, so many annuals, tender annuals. We just want four, we can be four weeks old and be perfect to go outside. So starting them four weeks before final frost is fabulous. And so when you're considering direct sow versus transplanting, here are some pros and cons to keep in mind. So let's talk direct sow first. Direct sowing, the pros, it's easy. You just put those seeds right in the ground. What can go wrong? There's some things that can go wrong, but <laughs> it's much more easy compared to starting indoors, especially if you don't have a whole seed starting set up indoors. Also pro, you don't need a light. A la, you don't need a seed starting set up. But the con is you're committing to thinning and also a lot more weeding with direct sowing. So here's the thing about transplanting pros and cons. The pros are you thin a lot less, you weed a lot less, you optimize absolutely every single seed, which I love. And if you love to mulch because you don't love to weed, transplanting just makes your mulching life that much easier. Cons, you need a seed starting setup <laughs> and you don't need something seriously fancy if you're just sowing four week old transplants. And if, you, if that seedling is even a little bit leaning toward the light, it is stressed and stress seedlings are always less healthy and thus less abundant than healthy unstressed seedlings. So whatever you can do, friends, to grow healthy transplants, you will be rewarded um, in so many times over. So yes, a few pros and cons of direct sowing versus transplanting. So now let's dive into this, trans this transplanting business. So days to germination, in general, the vast majority of garden seeds germinate optimally between 70 and 80 degrees Fahrenheit. 77 being that dream of dreams. So 77 degrees is generally a lot warmer than a lot of us keep our homes. So that's where heat mats make all the difference and a little goes a long way. We'll talk more about germination mats, heat mats in the very near future. Um, but know that for days to germ, you can, you can sow your seeds in any number of containers. My favorite are, of course, soil blockers. Let me move these wonderful little creatures to show you a little bit of, so soil blocks are, blockers are these amazing tools that decrease your use of single use plastics in your life for the rest of your life, really. And they create, they pop out these wonderful 
cubes of soil. And you can see without an edge there, without a plastic edge, roots don't get root bound. They, when the roots hit the air, they simply turn around as they have for millions of years <laughs> and go the other way. <laughs> so it, we'll talk about root bound plants really soon. It's so crucial to avoid root bound plants, especially with zinnias. Um, and so growing in in these beautiful soil blocks is so much the key. There are also mini blocks, which are awesome and optimize your heat mat. They also just ensure that your seeds are germinating that much faster. And these lovely little blocks pot up into the large blocks brilliantly. I find with many annuals, with perennial seeds and also with tomatoes, peppers, eggplants. These mini blocks make all the difference. But honestly, with basil, with zinnias, this large soil blocker is perfect. No frills, no fuss. So go ahead and start in those. You can also, of course, start in cell trays and or peat pots or cow pots. Cow pots are much more renewable than peat. Um, so, and, but cell trays, also an awesome option as well. So whatever you're doing to start your seeds, just go ahead and, you know, fill those containers. If you're growing them in not a soil block, you want to tamp down, whether it's the cow pots or six packs or these cell trays, tamp them down. Imagine my arm is the table. I'm going to just fill it with soil and tamp it down a few times gently. And that is reducing any of the air pockets that are in between uh, the soil. And so that way your roots of your burgeoning seedlings, they are finding just more nutrients and water instead of just air. And that will grow, help them grow healthier. Also, as you're transplanting them, they will be that much more effectively transplanted. So go ahead and fill any of your containers and whether it's soil blocks or cell trays, we sow two seeds in each of these cells, each of these soil blocks, and we thin them to one, the strongest one. This is the hardest part for so many people and I totally get it. You have to thin to the strongest one because even though they both look healthy, if you leave them both, they're not going to be healthy soon. They're going to be competing for light above the soil and nutrients water below the soil. And that additional humidity, we'll talk about damping off soon, is going to promote damping off and other kinds of great sadness that is very easy to avoid by thinning. And the good news is basil is a delicious thinning. So that basil that's a little smaller, go ahead and harvest it and eat it. You're going to eat the basil anyway, right? <laughs> So literally put that little thinning on a sandwich, on your curry. It's incredible. Zinnia is not so delicious, sadly. And if they're young enough, you can actually tease them apart and then break them into separate cells. Um, but that's where also sowing more than two seeds per cell is just making more work for you, not optimizing your seeds, and it's going to stress out those plants much more readily. So yes, a few keys to keep in mind. How deep do you sow them? You only sow seeds twice their depth. There are a few exceptions, a few flowers like snapdragons. They need light to germinate. There's a whole list of plant of seeds that need light to germinate in our rise and shine across the um, seasons. Um, pardon me, rise and shine starting seeds with ease book. And so definitely check that out for um, quite a list, but there's not many. And otherwise, you're just burying your seeds twice their depth, which is a really common mistake people make is just sowing seeds too deeply. So yes, don't sow them too deeply and thin them as soon as those cotyledons emerge. And take a peek. I have this lovely little six pack of basil that we will be sharing um, at our farm store here in the next few weeks, in a few weeks. And so you can see there's two, three seeds in that cell. This is, and those are the cotyledon leaves. This is the perfect time to be sowing, pardon me, to be thinning this basil. If it's, if they're getting taller, they're going to be stressing each other out. 
If they're smaller, totally option, totally awesome. If you already had thinned by this stage, it's a little harder and there there's less foliage. So they're a little less satisfying, delicious in the, I'm going to eat my thinnings department, <laughs> but yes, this is the perfect stage friends. So I am, you can see, I'll show you another, um, this is borage that we just thinned. And again, a seed pack for our garden store that we'll be sharing with folks. You can see these were already thin down to one and how beautiful, happy, spaced out, not stressed those beautiful seedlings are. So um, another thing to keep in mind, when you're growing transplants that are four weeks old or less, you don't need to be supplementally feeding them, whether it's with compost tea or fish emulsion or any number of things. There's plenty of, they're young enough, they're not going to be absorbing that many nutrients through their leaves. And if you have nutrient rich potting soil to begin with, they're good to go. So that's a nice thing about these quick, more quick and easy annual transplants. And here's the thing about not a few ways to prevent plants getting root bound. Number one, just start a little later than you think. Um, and namely, don't start too early. <laughs> and so we start four weeks before final frost, but let's talk because final frost when is that? <laughs> that can be here in zone five, fruition seeds, anytime from mid-May to early June. And so that's a few weeks span, <laughs> let's be honest. So it's impossible to say just how many, when that exact frost is going to be. So we tend to err on the side of a little bit later so that if it's an early frost, and then early final frost, well, we've got young transplants, but they'll be totally happy, healthy, healthy, unstressed transplants, always more abundant than older, more stressed transplants. Because if it's a late frost, then you have these old stress seedlings that are gonna be more root bound and less abundant. So we, even though there's an average frost date, for sure around Memorial Day is generally when folks plant their gardens. And because Memorial Day is quite late this year, chances are we'll be good to go. But sometimes it's closer to mid-May. And that is just, it can, sometimes that can be true. Sometimes we can still have frost two weeks later. So this is where it's time for a shameless plug, friends. If you're not already taking little notes, there are so many great ways to take notes. And this is one of them. We have our Across the Seasons Perpetual Calendar, which as a perpetual calendar, it has dates, one, two, three, four, five, but instead of Monday through Sunday, we have years. So you can see all these lovely notes from April, from May, 2020, and starting in on our notes from 2021. So you can see, record things like your frost date when it snowed two inches <laughs> on May 21st, all or April 21st, all kinds of things. When the warblers, the black-throated blue warblers return, when the trilliums emerge, and of course, when you sow your tomatoes, when you plant out your tomatoes, when you harvest your first tomatoes, when you notice septorial leaf spot on your tomatoes. So, so many ways to watch for patterns and we call it across the seasons so that as you're taking these notes, you can be amplifying your abundance across the seasons and I hope that you do. So yes, other keys for preventing root bound plants. Of course, there's just also planting in soil blocks. <laughs> they don't get root bound because there's no edge. Let's talk real quick. Root bound plants, root binding happens because these beautiful borage plants are sending down roots. And when those roots hit the edge of this plastic, they're going to just start running, <laughs> trying to get away from that waterless, nutrientless thing that they have come up against. So they start growing as quickly as they can to try to run away from it, right? So they end up just becoming root bound, circling all the way around this container, trying to effectively get out of the container. <laughs> and so, yes, the larger, if you use a cell, a soil block, they're not going to get root bound because they naturally air prune. But if you're growing in cell trays, just the larger the cell tray, the more soil, the more nutrients, 
the less likely they are to be root bound. Certainly they'll be root bound later than earlier. And finally, to prevent root binding, just get the most nutrient dense potting mix you possibly can. And we share two great options on our website for super nutrient dense potting mix for you friends. So next, it's really, I want to talk about damping off for a minute because these damping off, oh, hold on, we have a special guest. Dobby, Dobby wants to come say hi. Hi, Dobby. Um, so let's talk about damping off because it's really common that damp, that plants, especially annuals, can get damping off. And it's basically this suite of bacteria and also fungi that have the same exact um, kind of impact on the plants where the plants will look fine. The foliage looks beautiful, but then you'll start to see one, two flopping over. And then it's like wildfire. The entire tray has flopped over and the leaves look just fine. But it's that lowest most stem closest to the ground where it just turns brown and mushy. And that basically is a function of too much humidity. And so there's a lot of wonderful ways that you can, the good news is, for as the bad news is it's common and easy to have happen. The good news is it's entirely preventable. <laughs> so actually in that of Rise and Shine, um, starting Seeds with Ease book, we have a whole chapter on the six keys to beat damping off. So definitely download this if you haven't already. Um, and they basically come down to this. You want to use moist potting mix when you're sowing your seeds so that you actually don't have to water initially. The less you overhead water your plants, the better. And also heat mats. Heat mats just help your plants grow faster as well as lights. And then it also disperses humidity faster, which it's that humidity that is creating that perfect environment for those bacteria and fungi that create the damping off phenomena. Also, don't use humidity domes. Ah, I wish I could broadcast this. <laughs> so no one would ever use humidity domes unless they were grafting. <laughs> so they really are, they cause so much more issues than they do joys <laughs> in gardeners and farmers' lives. So don't use humidity domes. And if you do, go ahead and just use it. But as soon as that first seedling emerges from the soil, go ahead and take it off. You need airflow and humidity domes take that airflow down to zero and increase that humidity to 100%. So you're just asking for trouble with the humidity domes. So <laughs> I digress. Wait, I don't digress. That's so on point. <laughs> so our next key for preventing damping off, resist top watering until the top millimeter of your soil is dry. And if you're wanting to prevent algae that just greenish on the top, it's not the worst. It's honestly not going to affect your plants terribly, but it is a little unsightly and it's not ideal. So it's very preventable. Same thing as fungus nets. Just make sure that you're watering, overhead watering only after that top millimeter of your soil of your seedlings thoroughly dries out. And if you're bottom watering, awesome. Bottom watering is where instead of top watering, I'm lifting up the tray and I am the tray that drains with holes. And in that bottom tray that doesn't drain without holes, I'm just adding a little bit of water. So there's standing water on that bottom of that tray and it's wicking up into your seedlings so that it's keeping water right in the roots, right where you need it most. And so yes, check out our whole blog about bottom watering. And there's a whole section in our Rise and Shine um, Starting Seeds with Ease book about that as well. So yes, finally, um, oh, two more thoughts in the preventing damping off department. Thinning, yes. If you thin early and often, you are actively right, creating more airflow capacity and decreasing humidity. Amazing. Also pot up early and often, which it's true for a lot of these three, four week old annual seedlings, you don't need to pot them up. But as a general rule, if you are <laughs> concerned about airflow, if there's dramatic overlap of leaves, you're decreasing airflow and increasing humidity, which just increases your susceptibility to damping 
So there you have it, friends. Isn't that simple? Now we just have to go do it. <laughs> but yes, the more that you can decrease um, the humidity and increase the airflow around your seedlings, damping off is so rampant and so preventable. So now let's talk about transplanting these tender annuals, whether it's broccoli or pardon me, basil, zinnias. Here are a few things to keep in mind. Tender annuals mean they're tender, they're cold sensitive, they're frost sensitive. So you wanna make sure that you're, if you're direct sowing them, you're direct sowing them when the soil is nice and toasty after final frost, when you're planting out your tomatoes or you're transplanting them after final frost. So, if you are also, so hardening off your plants is so crucial and hardening off your beautiful seedlings makes all the difference. Hardening off basically just means acclimation. You're acclimating your tender seedlings who have survived, thrived in your cozy kitchen or maybe in your toasty greenhouse <laughs> and all of a sudden what there's wind <laughs> what is this weird thing rain from the sky <laughs> what is this direct sunlight so acclimating your seedlings to life outside is so crucial so that's generally a four to seven day is the ideal window to be hardening off acclimating your transplants so that they're acclimating they're adjusting to life outside so by the time you're asking them to adjust to life by transplanting them, which is a pretty significant shock, <laughs> they're not being shocked by all of these variables all at once. So here are some tips for transplanting that apply not just to your tender annuals, but to everything. First and foremost, as you're getting ready to transplant them, shower them in water, ideally nutrient-rich water, whether it's with fish and kelp emulsion, whether it's with your own homegrown, homemade compost tea. If you can add nutrients to the water as you're showering them before you transplant, so much the better. And that water is going to help them lift out of their cells or even in their um, soil blocks that much more easily so you're not disrupting the roots. And if you can add nutrients to that, it's just packing their knapsack full of snacks quick aside your plants growing in your garden is totally an adventure for them <laughs> think about climbing a mountain an adventure for us we want to have a snack in fact a bag lunch i'll have two sandwiches thank you <laughs> like the more snacks and sandwiches the more nutrients you have for this adventure that you're going on the better off you're going to be so Feed your plants early and often abundantly, and they will surround you with that much more abundance. So yes, water in all of your seedlings before you're transplanting them. And as much as you can shower them with nutrients like our fish and kelp emulsion, so much the better. So once you've showered them <laughs> in all kinds of water then and or nutrients, and you're planting them out, put in hope, as you're planting them in the holes, you can actually put a handful of compost or a handful perhaps of our granular organic slow release fertilizer in that hole. So again, you're packing them with a bag lunch, <laughs> sending them off with a bag lunch. And so just adding nutrients at that moment as well is so crucial. And if you are planting from a six pack, go ahead and just crinkle the sides ever so slightly. And what this does, it's like separating the soil and the roots, especially if they're root bound, that'll just allow them to release that much easier. And if you do have root bound seedlings, go ahead and scrunch up those roots a little bit. You want to be breaking the roots a little bit. If you're not root bound, you don't wanna do that. But if they are root bound, that will allow those root hairs to then be like, oh yeah, oh my gosh, I might have more access to more nutrients now. That'll allow them to break out of the root binding more quickly. So then go ahead and plant them, you know, at that proper spacing, which it'll say, 
on the packet what the proper spacing is. For many tender annuals, it's a foot, like basil and zinnias are one foot. You could have the basil a little bit closer um, if you are harvesting it younger or, but I honestly, we do it at one foot centers and that is definitely what I recommend. Same with zinnias. And oh my gosh, if you're back, as you're tamping in your seedling, as you transplant it, go ahead and press the soil down again, just like how we tamp the cell trays to reduce the air pockets. You want to do that when you're transplanting as well. So that way your plants have more <laughs> nutrients, right? Rather than just air with no nutrients and no water for them. So yes, and if you're if you have a little bit extra water and or nutrient dense water, i.e. fish emulsion or compost tea, go ahead and water in those transplants, and they will be so much more abundant for the world, or at least for you, and I hope with your wider community and everyone you love as well. So, and then if you're mulching, go ahead and mulch right away. That's another reason I just love transplanting all of our tender annuals so that whether it's in biotella or with straw, any number of mulch materials, it just reduces weeding and reduces the need for water. Now let's talk about watering for a moment. Anytime you can water the soil and not the foliage, not the leaves of plants, you will be doing yourself such a huge favor. Let's talk about disease now, because as we talked about with damping off in the seedling stage, that is so much a function of humidity creating the perfect environment for these little bacteria to, and fungi to do their thing. And so most diseases that we have are you know, bacteria or fungi. And so water is the primary ve vector for every disease on the planet. So the more you can reduce humidity and increase airflow, not just in your seedlings, but in your garden for the rest of the season, that is one of the easiest ways to prevent disease, right? Prevention is the best cure. And specifically for basil, the biggest issue we have in here in the Northeast with basil is downy mildew. And that generally, it cuts fungal disease that comes up from the South on the airwaves every summer. It doesn't overwinter for us, thank goodness, in our cold <laughs> Northeast seasons. And so, it generally doesn't arrive from down south until August and and generally it's been late August but honestly it's becoming it's coming earlier and earlier so a few other things to keep in mind um, and zinnias are also susceptible to powdery mildew is the main disease that they are susceptible to so a few keys across the board, across plant types, not far beyond zinnias and basil to just reducing disease susceptibility in organically. Number one, just nutrient density, whether it's from the potting soil that you begin with to the soil you plant in. We feed every two weeks with our fish and cob emulsion. Just, you know, I'm more healthy when I am eating well and I'm less stressed. So the same is true for plants. Plants totally have immune systems, just like you and I, and plants that are more stressed, the insects and the diseases know it. It is the stressed potatoes that get the Colorado potato beetles first, and it will be your most stressed, sad zinnias that get powdery mildew first. So anything you can do to boost your their nutrient density, so much the better. Also full sun, of course, full sun, that means they have the most energy they can be creating. The more foliage, the more flowers, but that also means, right, more airflow, or not airflow, but <laughs> less humidity because there's more sun, more of the day. Um, and then, yeah, water the soil, not the leaves. I can't say it often enough. It is such a mantra. And if you're using drip irrigation, use drip irrigation rather than soaker hoses that send water in all the directions. Drip just lets it drip down instead of spraying up. So crucial. Um, and also crop, crop rotation, so important. And also you can get disease resistant varieties as well. And that is another great option. So um, in terms of containers, let's talk about growing zinnias and basil in containers. So in general, bigger is better. 
And that's a phrase that I never use outside container gardening. <laughs> and it's just true in container gardening. It's because no matter how big your container garden is, that container is still a thimble of soil compared to the volume of soil that your plants have access to in your larger garden. And so don't skimp. Don't skimp, whether it's compost, whether it's our slow release organic granular fertilizer, you've got so many options. Go ahead and don't skimp in your gardens in general, but especially in containers. There is a direct result, um, a direct correlation between the quantity and quality of nutrients that you offer your plants and containers and the quality, quantity of abundance that you will be harvesting. So I recommend 10 gallons minimum, honestly, for everything. You don't have to water as much, you, and you just, the plants have way more access to nutrients. So 10 gallons minimum, 15 is the dream. We have really nice containers on our website that we love to share that are fabric, so they breathe, so plants don't get root bound. And another, oh, before I go any further, if you didn't already know, we have a whole totally free eight keys of container gardening mini course that you can hop online on our website, fruitionseeds.com and jump in and you'll find tons of tips, keys, strategies, things that we've learned the hard way. So hopefully you don't have to learn them the hard way. So if you're interested in container gardening, there is so much more to share. And that mini course on container gardening will do do wonders to set you up for success. So I also love with containers to mulch them because it just means we have to water them less and containers just dry out much more readily than garden soil. I also love to put the tallest plants at the center of the containers and surround them kind of in a donut, a moat of smaller plants. So whether that's, imagine a great big basil with shorter parsley along the sides or a great big summer savory plant with cut and come again dill and cilantro around the edges. That's a really wonderful way to be maximizing your surface area and to be optimizing the light and height in that kind of companion planting context as well. So another thing to keep in mind with container gardening, some containers are darker than others and dark containers are going to be much more hot, <laughs> have much more thermal mass. And so in the case of zinnias, for example, that's awesome because zinnias, let's talk, they're from the cent Central America. They love xeric conditions. So dry, hot, they thrive in dry, hot conditions. When we grow zinnias, as we often do in our high tunnels, so they have higher quality and quantity of seeds that we can share with you, they are easily, I mean, six plus feet tall. It's fairly ludicrous where our zinnias in our gardens here in zone five will still be impressive. They'll be three and four feet, but significantly smaller and significantly less blooms. So yes, zinnias love to be hot and dry. And as long as they have plenty of nutrients and not bone dry, go ahead and plant them in dark containers. Basil by contrast, yes, it's from the Mediterranean, but it's in the Mediterranean more like Mendocino County style, like Sicily, like it's like right on the ocean. <laughs> like it's not loving the heat. It will bolt more and not, and it can be dry-ish, but it would much rather be amply moist. And so you definitely want to have a not so dark container for basil. It will just make the basil more stressed and thus will bolt. And as we'll talk about soon with some harvest tips, the sweetest, most tender basil is basil before it flowers. So now let's talk about companion planting just briefly. There's so much more to share and check out our whole, our blog that is Fruition's Guide to Companion Planting. There's so much more to share with this, but just know that in for basil and zinnias specifically, basil and zinnias, we tend to plant just everywhere. They're so fabulously beautiful and delicious and highly attractive to all kinds of beneficial insects. For example, basil is really lovely for ladybugs and lacewings. They just love to hang out in that abundant um, habitat in your, in your basil. 
And also zinnias are very, they attract white flies. So there's a whole other thing there that we can talk about soon. But yes, so I love to tuck basil. Honestly, we, if you plant them in between your tomatoes. So we plant tomatoes on two foot centers. So two feet between our plants. So initially, you know, of course those plants are pretty small. So for the first six weeks, as those tomatoes are growing and growing and growing, there's plenty of space plenty of light for that basil to be growing abundantly as well. So that is just a perfect way to be harvesting kind of your cake and eat it too, <laughs> right? Lots of basil. And then so as those tomato plants get larger, they will overshadow that basil and you can either keep harvesting the basil or just harvest it all and take it away. And that I do recommend because in that context, it will reduce humidity, right? And increase airflow between plants, which will just increase <laughs> your capacity of plants to be resilient in terms of disease, to not be as susceptible to disease. Um, so yes, there's so much more to share in the companion planting department and definitely check out our blog, our, um, our fruition's guide to companion planting for so much more. And now a few tips on harvesting basil and zinnias with basil first. As a general rule, all herbs are most flavorful, most sweet, most tender before they flower. And so that generally is the first like two months of their lives. It depends. So, but if soon as they start to flower, they, they're enzymatically creating all kinds of different compounds, basically making themselves less delicious so that they can um, not be predated as much by large munching mammals like me. <laughs> and they can actually mature their seeds to spread them and be the next generation. So yes, um, harvesting before they flower is great. So with basil specifically, here are some tips and there you'll find a whole blog and some great videos just on our website under basil about this. You can pinch back the apical bud. And that looks like, I mean, imagine, so the apical bud is the growth point. So let's take this piercicaba broccoli, also in a six pack that we'll be sharing with some beautiful human at our garden store in the next couple of weeks. So we have our leaves coming up here, but then take a look in the middle. Can you see? There's that little tiny leaf that's coming up in the middle, that brand new leaf burgeoning. That's the apical bud. And so on basil, imagine basil where it's like two leaves, their leaves are opposite. So there's two leaves and then there's another two leaves and then another two leaves. And so just keep pinching, rather than harvesting the lower largest leaves, go ahead and pinch the newest leaves, that apical bud, pinch them back. And when you pinch off that apical bud, that forces the energy down and then out into the newest axillary buds. So once you have that one, pick that first apical bud, then you have two apical buds growing out. So it makes basil much more bushy and that much more for you to harvest because then you can pinch back each of those two and then those two will become four, will become 16 and you'll always be harvesting the youngest, most sweet, most tender basil leaves and, and it's the flowers will emerge from that apical bud as well, right? So that is the best way to be harvesting fresh delicious basil leaves and <laughs> making sure that they are flowering at the latest possible moment as well. So basil does love to go to seed and especially in the heat of summer. So we find that no matter how much we are pinching back that basil, that we succession so just so we have tons and tons of basil all the time. <laughs> and also so every month we're sowing fresh basil for a consistent harvest of fresh, beautiful leaves. And also another just note of honesty, although I love basil before it flowers, I eat plenty of basil after it flowers. 
it's still quite delicious. And let's be honest, there's just so much else to do with our lives besides just constantly be pinching back basil. So please don't feel like you can't eat your basil once it's flowering and you can't make pesto. <laughs> you certainly can. Just know that your plant, that the flavor is a little different and not quite as sweet, but oh my gosh, just keep tasting it, experience it for yourself. I eat tons of basil that's flowering. So don't let me dissuade you any otherwise. So some harvest tips for zinnias. So the great news is, and for so many flowers, they have a very short phase life. And so there's a lot of tips and tricks on our website. Also floretteflowers.com is an awesome way to find tons of great resources on how to be harvesting flowers so that they have the most optimum phase life. But no, the zinnias, make it easy. They easily have a week, 10 day, even two weeks. <laughs> if we have zinnias on our windowsill that's north facing um, of, uh, all summer by our sink, and it's easily there for two weeks because it doesn't have direct light hitting it. And I mean, just they have, zinnias have ludicrous vase lives. Um, so they're really satisfying for cut flowers. And they're also really satisfying for cut flowers because they generally have those long, wonderful stems. And so the great thing about zinnia is the more you harvest, the more you'll have to harvest, just like that basil. When you pinch back that April glow bud, then two more will start to grow. Pinch back those two, the axillary buds just beneath them will make four, 16. Same is true for zinnias. So the more you harvest, the more you'll harvest. <laughs> if you do let flowers go to seed, they generally tend to flower less. So here at Fruition Seeds, because we grow everything for seed, <laughs> we have all of these zinnias going gangbusters and then they continue to flower, but because a lot of them are then allowed to go fully and mature their seed, we tend to see them not tapering off. But know that if you're constantly harvesting those blossoms, you will have that many more just coming up after them. And also um, the keep in mind that your biggest zinnias are going to be those first few, like really four, six weeks of zinnias. Um, as the season goes on, the diameter of those zinnias will get less and less and less and less, and they'll still be very impressive. Um, but they will lessen. Oh, I can't remember if I mentioned this or not, but just another reminder, um, root, uh, reasons to not let zinnias get root bound, they actually revert back into single ray petals rather than their great big flush of dahlia style petals when they're root bound. So if they get root bound, they can still bounce back and be all right. It's totally worth planting them. Don't fear, but know that you're rolling the dice. And the more root bound they are, the more stressed they are, the more highly likely it is that, that your zinnias, even the big dahlia style ones, will revert back to a single ray of petals. And I also just want to throw this out there in the <laughs> Zinderella department, which Zinderella is this crazy, so Seuss, Dr. Seuss totally approves of this zinnia. It's so beautiful and wild. And I was warned this before we grew them. And I was like, gosh, I can't imagine that being true, but maybe it is. And in fact, it is totally true for whatever reason. This is the only zinnia like this. Other ones don't do this. But for the Zinderella style, that first flush will always be a single petal and just kind of awkward and the colors will be splotchy. It's a very homely zinnia when they first blossom, that first flush, for whatever reason. You'll be like, wow, I know Petra warned me, but really, like, I grew zinnias because they're beautiful. And why did I get these zinnias? Have that thought, and then I hope you remember this moment. Just cut them back, cut off those first blossoms, cut them fully back. And then that second flush, for whatever reason, that second flush all of a sudden turns into the magic that is Zinderella in all of her susical <laughs> whimsy. So yes, that is the key with Zinderella Peach and all the other Zinderella style. Um, zinnias as well. So quickly, I just want to run through the common mistakes for zinnias and basil, and then 
we will call it a night. So common mistakes, people so often just way too early. Everything in general, people so just everything too early. So go ahead, try to err on the later side, keeping in mind that your final frost is an average of dates. So err on the later side of that average rather than the earlier. And it's so hard in the age of social media to actually hold off. You're going, if you're planting at the proper time, it's going to feel like you are just so late and you're going to be so, and you're so late. <laughs> don't worry, everything's just fine. <laughs> we literally just sewed our zinnias last week and a few more today. So you're in right in time. Other common mistakes people make, just stressed as a general rule, stressed transplants are less abundant than unstressed transplants and age is, and not planting in good soil mix, it's are the two things that most commonly make transplants stressed. As, so don't plant too early again. And then just keep in mind that you don't want to, if they're going, if they're younger and also leaning toward the light, that is a sure sign that your transplants are stressed for light. It's very tempting to turn them around because then they'll straighten up, right? It's just exacerbating the issue. So either plant them out as quickly as you can or invest in a grow light you'll have for the rest of your life. We love to share the ones that we love that our friend Vic makes in Indiana on our website. So yes, and then review those damping off keys. Already we're getting phot photographs, emails of people suffering from damping off seedlings, which is just so sad, but it's just so preventable. So common mistakes, damping off, <laughs> so easy solution, <laughs> download. <laughs> are <laughs> Rise and Shine Starting Seeds with These ebook. It's totally free. We also have these beautiful paper copies on our website and there's a whole chapter in how to prevent them. Uh, basically reducing humidity and increasing airflow. And also planting too close. Planted too close, plants are going to be more stressed. Um, you're not going to harvest as many zinnias and your basil is going to want to flower, go to seed earlier. So it won't be as sweet and tender as long. And they'll all be that much more susceptible to powdery mildew, to downy mildew. Um, and yeah, keep in mind that the more you harvest with basil, with zinnias, the more you will harvest. So go ahead and harvest for you. Go ahead and harvest for so many other people you love. One of the biggest common mistakes of people gardening in America is thinking that you are growing your garden <laughs> for you. And I would love, I need to remember all the time that I am gardening, not for me, but for you. And your garden is in fact our garden. How can you be growing not just for you and not just thinking about those 40 quarts of tomato sauce you want to put in your pantry, but who is most hungry in your community? Who also brings you the most joy and you just want to thank <laughs> with basil and zinnias in your life. Plant a little extra so that you have plenty to share with the people who share so much joy with you in your lives. So, Yes, thank you for knowing that seeds are not as small as they seem, that you are not as small as you seem. Have so much fun as you are growing and yourselves as well as your gardens and know that we are so abundantly here for you, friends. So huge love to Kira and Miriam for our interpretation this night. Thank you for sharing your joy and language justice. I love you, friends. And thank you, Matthew. I love you, too, who's upstairs chatting with you in the chat. Thank you, Matthew. <laughs> and thank you all who have joined us live. It's such a joy to not be alone on this beautiful, quite chilly <laughs> mid-April evening. And thank you to everyone who's actually listening listening to this after the fact, we love you as well. And if you would do us the huge favor, the great joy, come off mute and say good night, good evening, happy spring, and see you soon, friends. <laughs> Thank you. Good night. Thank you. This was great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Good night. You. I love your puppy. Thank you. Puppy's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.